Africa. But first, it's extraordinary to think, isn't it, that this month marks 20 years since Michael Watson's infamous rematch with Chris Eubank. On September the 21st, 1991, the two men fought for the vacant WBO World Super Middleweight title at White Hart Lane. And now, Mike, before we get into that night particularly, just give us a little bit of a background to the fight itself. Well, this is the era that Joe Calzaki wishes he was born into, the era fondly referred to by sports fans way beyond the confines of boxing as the Ben Watson Eubank era. Steve Collins would join the mix slightly later. Eubank was 25, Watson was 26. They were in the prime of their professional lives. Both had beaten Nigel Benn in the build-up to this fight. And it was a time when boxers enjoyed a much loftier status than they do now. It's said that as many as 12 million people watched this particular fight on ITV. It was also a time when it seemed as though in the middleweight and super middleweight divisions that they inhabited, that the rest of the world didn't matter because there was so much going on on the domestic front. And this was actually a rematch of a fight between Eubank and Watson earlier that year in June of 1991 at Earl's Court for the WBO middleweight title, which Eubank won, but just about everybody at ringside said that Watson should have got the nod. So the rematch, which incidentally was for the super middleweight title and a vacant title at that, didn't really need much stoking. It took place, as you say, at White Hart Lane and it was Michael Watson's third attempt to win a world title. Well, that fight on that evening 20 years ago was a memorable one. It left a lasting effect on boxing in this country. He's hit by another right from Watson, and another one, and he's down. Eubank is down. He gets up again. What a turnaround in this 11th round. He spits out blood. He was up at about three, and he scores with a right uppercut and puts Watson down. My goodness me. Eubank floors Watson. They're both down as the bell goes to end the round and Watson is on jelly legs he would not have been able to continue we have bedlam chaos here has Watson had enough time to recover I don't think he has he all oh, the referee took a long look in his eyes Eubank I think thinks he can finish it here and Watson is having to cover up Eubank's going here for the finish he was so groggy at the end of the last round Watson he could be stopped his head has got to clear and it's a survival job now. The referee is looking to stop it. Oh, he has stopped it. He stopped it. Well, Michael Watson is being carried out of the ring on a stretcher, I can tell you. And these are anxious moments for the Commonwealth middleweight champion because he has got medical attention in here now and people are being cleared out of the ring and this is dreadful to see after such a memorable contest we've had problems outside the ring here in this auditorium and now i'm afraid to say there are problems inside the ring well that was john rawling and ian dark at white hart lane that night <laughs> watson spent 40 days in a coma and suffered serious brain injuries now mike and steve you are both at white hart lane um what are your memories of that night steve well, the, the memories of the night started in the morning. There was a weigh-in. In fact, there were two weigh-ins for this fight because uh, they uh, they were both boxing outside of their weight, so they had to uh, two weigh-ins. And one was uh, for the, for the press, which was them both in theory weighing a weight, but they've already weighed in that morning. They had to come in at a certain weight, so it started very early at the uh, Grosvenor House in Park Lane and built all the way up to fight night. And going into that eleventh round, Michael was in front, but not as in, not as far in front as people imagine. He was in front, and and the fight bizarrely. And Mike reminded me of this earlier on wasn't actually that good until about round nine or ten. Of course, then it became incredible. Once once it was over, and there's a lot of myths attached to this. The fight actually ended at ten fifty four. Watson was carried out of the ring at eleven oh eight. In fact, he was passed over. Uh, the heads of Ian Dark and John Rawlin. Tim Westwood, the Radio 1 DJ, was holding one corner of the stretcher. Jimmy Tibbs, his trainer, was holding another corner of the stretcher. A very distressed-looking uh, medical person was holding another corner, and Michael's friend Camel was holding another corner. He was rushed to a hospital. And the, the, the problem with this hospital is this was the North Middlesex. He arrived there at 11.22. The problem with this hospital was they didn't have the correct um, the correct equipment to, um, to basically... Um, apply all sorts of emergency procedures. They, they did manage to resuscitate him slightly. He arrived there, his pupils were fixed and dilated, and by the time he left, one of them had unfixed. He left there at 11.55. Now, what someone will have realised is he's already gone outside the golden hour. So he really is now... 
um, living a charmed life, to say the least. He was rushed to Bar- Bart's hospital, arriving there uh, sometime around 12, tw- uh, 12 20, 12 30, and about three minutes to one, he was rushed into surgery. He was prepped and rushed into surgery, emerging at 4.20. Now, there wasn't a delay. Some people say there was a delay. Well, there were loads of delays, but there wasn't a delay with the neurosurgeon, although Peter Hamlin, who became, who was the neurosurgeon, um, he did have um, problems getting into the hospital. He was uh, on call and he was rushed in, rushed from, rushed from a family doing, got to St Bart's Hospital, and there was such a mass crowd outside, he couldn't come through the main entrance. And so, uh, and the only thought he had as he tr- looked for alternative entrances, he was concerned about a bag lady who'd been living in the entrance for years, and the nurses and the doctors fed her. So he was a bit concerned that she was being trampled. At that, this point, all he knew was that a man had been injured in a fight. He couldn't work out. He didn't know it was boxing at this point. So he he rushes around the back of the hospital and he's trying doors and he knows this one particular door and he pushed it and it was closed so he was by this time he's really angry with himself because he knows he's got to go back and fight his way for all the TV crews and suddenly the door opened the bag lady somehow sensing that it was a melee out the front had gone to the back of the hospital to let him in and then he went upstairs mm. and did his bit we'll come back to the story in a moment we'll hear from Dr Peter Hamlin very shortly and, and we're remembering the uh, infamous Watson Eubank fight of 20 years ago and my Mike, we just heard Steve describing that extraordinary and chaotic uh, scene as, my, as uh, Michael Watson was taken to the hospital and Dr Peter Hamlin trying to get in. But it's largely because of Dr Peter Hamlin that Michael Watson is still with us now. You've been speaking to him, haven't you? Yes, and, and he's come to be inspired and amazed in equal parts by Watson. They became great friends and Dr Hamlin was actually with Michael Watson when Watson completed the London Marathon, incredibly, in 2003. And that's a feat that Dr Hamlin would never have thought possible as he set about saving Watson's life on that night at Bart's 20 years ago. He was still standing at the end of that fight, though couldn't stand again for many years. And that is all secondary problems, bleeding that occurred. And there it's the speed of intervention that determines the outcome. I was going to say, I've often heard in covering boxing over the past couple of decades, this phrase used, the golden hour. Can you explain how important it is to get to somebody like you quickly from ringside? It's absolutely vital. If you look at other boxers, Rod Douglas, who was fighting Harold Graham for his title and lost in the fifth round, he had exactly the same acute subdural hematoma, a blood clot on the brain, as Michael Watson. It was on the same side of his head. He had the same surgeons, the same hospitals. The difference was that he got to hospital very quickly and he was out of intensive care unit in a day and at home a week later. If you look at Michael Watson, by contrast, uh, there were, for a variety of reasons, long delays in his getting to the same operation. He spent a month in ITU had a series of five operations, four months in neurosurgical wards having intensive treatments, eight months in a hospital having rehabilitation, and thereafter had a decade where he gradually climbed his way back to his current life, still with troubles, but with many fewer than he had. And all because of the delay in, in getting proper treatment? Yes. If one had been able to intervene at that very time, he would have done very well. The lamentable position in Britain is that there's only about 30 hospitals that have doctors who can do that. So unless you've got an arrangement to go to one of those hospitals, and unless you have an arrangement whereby the anaesthetist who can give you the oxygen is at the venue, you're going to be committed to going to the nearest hospital to get the resuscitation, and then back into an ambulance to go to a hospital to get your operation. Now that was the trip that Michael went on, and it's too long. And for that reason, they altered the regulations to bring in what's known as the Formula One standards, which is where you've got resuscitation at trackside, ringside, and you go direct to the right hospital. When the operation begins, the whole procedure starts. Can you take me through that, whether it's Rod Douglas or Michael Watson has arrived on a bed in front of you? What's the process from there on? If you have a boxer who was conscious when the last blow was thrown, and subsequently becomes unconscious, you have an emergency. You have to get oxygen into the lungs, you have to get a scan done, and then you will very probably see some form of blood clot, and that blood clot has to be taken out. The operation involves lifting a portion of the skull about the size of a saucer, uh, and you take out a blood clot, which is usually about the size of a saucer of milk. 
Would you describe Michael Watson's recovery as a miracle? Well, I think so. He was iller and was more severely affected than any other person I've encountered. So he was close to being dead for longer than anyone I've seen who has either survived long term or got anywhere near the level of recovery he has now. Whenever your name is mentioned in boxing circles, the name of Michael is, is always in the same sentence. Did it get to the stage where Michael became, even in treatment, more than a patient to you? Can you afford to get emotionally involved? I think you're emotionally involved in all your patients. Um, you can't, at least I can't, do the job without getting involved in it. And I didn't get to know Michael until five or six years after his injury, when he was able to communicate on those planes. I got inklings of that within a few months of his starting to regain consciousness, which was many months after his injury, um, and just how stubborn he was and how determined he was. His early humour was fantastic, and it came through very early on. And the more time has gone on, the more one has got to know him, and it has become a friendship. I think I've said more than once, I think he's done more for me spiritually than I can conceive I've done for him physically. He's a remarkable man, just in the way he's tackled the disabilities he's got. We occasionally go to schools and talk to school children about the events that surrounded him, and the initial thoughts was that we'd teach kids why they should look after their brain. Um, but actually they get to ask him about what it's like to be famous and what it was like being a boxer. And again, a, a remarkable thing that I've heard him say on more than one occasion, he said that his head injury was one of the best things that's ever happened to him. And he's grateful to the Lord um, that he allowed him to have it so that he could become the person he is. Well, that's Dr Peter Hamlin who operated on Michael Watson 20 years ago. I mean, Steve, just t tell us how Michael is now uh, and, and the, the progress that he's made, bearing in mind what we just heard Dr Hamlin describe of how he was on that night. Well, his mind's perfectly OK because there's a big function for him on uh, Tuesday and he uh, looked at the list of people at his lawyer's office um, just this afternoon and realised I wasn't on the list and had his lawyer call me. So his mind <laughs> certainly functioned uh, very well. So I'm, I'm thankful to it for him for that. And, and he does have a tremendous sense of humour. Um, and be I'll be honest with you, a better sense of humour now than he had before the, before the fight. And he, he has, I think he has probably bad bad months as opposed to bad days certainly sometimes you see him and he can talk brilliantly and he's fine he's brilliant at communication communicating and he, and he can sit down in a restaurant easy and other times he gets tired and perhaps he gets pushed what what he can't do it is he can't do a lot so you can't book him in at 10 o'clock at one o'clock and at five that evening and expect to see the best of michael watson what you got to do and this is how when i wrote the book of him this is how we went about the book is i let him get up at his own pace 9 10 11 12 o'clock then we went then we drove to a restaurant and i fed him then we walked for a couple of hours and it got him excited. Then we sat down for an hour. By about four o'clock, he was ready for a sleep and that's what he should do. So some of the times you may have seen him either here at the BBC or maybe you've been at a function and he looks exhausted and he looks a bit drained and his eyes are droopy. That's because he's had too hard and too long a day. He is obviously you know, inhibited on what, on what he can do and, and what he can't do, but he managed to perform the marathon he can talk brilliantly what he can't do and is he can't do studios he can't do lights and he can't do people and he can't do noises and that's what everybody that's ever had any kind anything wrong with their head or a stroke or any kind of injury that they're, they're, they're all the same so it's no di michael watson's no different he couldn't be in this studio now mm. it would be garbage but yep. we could go and we could go and interview him in his house with gentle lighting, no problem. Which we did. One of our reporters, George Riley, went to see him just before the London Marathon this year, and and what we heard was absolutely inspirational. Mm. So when you get him on the right day at the right time, yep. he's still brilliant. And he's clearly inspiring the new generation as well, as we heard Dr. Hamlin say. I mean, I suppose the trouble is that the nature of boxing means that head injuries are a, an ever-present threat. And I was speaking to Dr. Hamlin also during the course of that interview some time ago about 
What boxers experience, what they sense when they're hit on the head like that. I mean, we're talking severe trauma akin to a car crash. And there are instances in the past which have been graphically described by a couple of people that have really taken my notice. Barry McGuigan repeats a story in the book that he had published earlier this year about a fight he had just before he won the world title in the middle of 1985. Earlier that year, he boxed a guy called Juan Laporte and he took a really strong right hand towards the end of the contest and the sense in his mind after taking that right hand was that he was transplanted back to being a kid in his aunt's toy shop just along the road from where he lived in Clonus and that all happened in a split second. Floyd Patterson when he was beaten in a fight for his world heavyweight title by a Swede called Ingemar Johansson in the late 1950s spoke about taking a heavy shot from Johansson and floating above the ring almost in one of these near-death experiences and looking down at himself and telling himself to get up <laughs> and then also talking about seeing John Wayne at ringside sitting at a slant and he realises that, well, if John Wayne is sitting at a slant, then he must have been knocked down. And I was talking to Dr Hamlin about this and, and what boxers are going through, and he said that our brains and, and, and our memories basically are a carousel of slides of all of our lives, and these severe traumas ret retrieve these slides at random, and that's what was happening to, to McGuigan and, and, to, and to a lesser extent to, to Floyd Patterson, and it just is another sense of what... I've used this quote so many times, but it's, it's so, so emphatic and so true that Roberto Duran says that boxers go to dark places that nobody else inhabits, and, and these stories underline that. Mm. And it changed boxing, though, that night, didn't it? You know, yes, it did. All, for everything that happened to Michael Watson, the positive thing was that boxing has never been the same. And it had to, as Dr Hamlin was referring to there. They, they introduced what are known as Formula One standards. I mean, it's, it's amazing to believe that there wasn't mm. oxygen at ringside. There wasn't even a stretcher at ringside. Mm. The doctor, I, I think at the time, felt so helpless that he put his briefcase down for, for mm. Watson to rest his head on. It, he, he had to offer something. But now, you know, there are, there are paramedics, trained paramedics at ringside. There's oxygen. There's uh, ambulances on standby. The, the, the nearest hospital that, that, that can cope with a, a neurosurgical injury is aware of the bill going on in their environs that night. So it's much, much safer. And there are boxers such as Spencer Oliver, who does a lot of work for us here on Five Live, Paul Ingle, who will say that their lives have been saved. You cannot say it categorically, but they will say that their lives have been saved because of the plight that night of Michael Watson. I mean... Uh, Spencer Oliver was resuscitated in the ring, stabilised in the ring and transported to hospital and seven days later he basically checked himself out and his, his injury was as severe as Michael's, very similar injury so I'm told in fact the guy that operated on that uh, was I think also present when Michael had his operation and and, uh, and that's because of what Michael went through and there were there have been since then, this is 19, 2000, uh, two, sorry, this is 1991, there have been half a dozen instances since then and because of the rules and regulations set in place by Michael um, through Michael's injury. Lives have, without a doubt, been saved. And also, it's not just that the neurological unit has to be alerted. Mike has to be within a certain distance. I forget what that distance is. And that put a bit of a pressure because one or two venues around the country could no longer do it. And as Hamlin said, lamentably, there's only 30 mm. places in the country where fights can take place. Okay.